Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece. Episode 5, Minoan Crete. The Minoans on Crete were an early source of cultural inspiration for the Greeks. Crete is the largest and southernmost island in Greece. It separates the Aegean Sea from the Libyan Sea. Like the Greek mainland, Crete is very mountainous, but in the central and eastern parts of the island, There are fairly large fertile plains for agriculture. The local inhabitants followed the same developmental path of other Neolithic sites, with the establishment of small farming villages, specialization of labor, and social and political hierarchy. By around 3500 BC, these small farming villages grew into substantial towns, marking the earliest traces of what we would label as civilization. With population growth and increasing agricultural production, the chiefs of these major settlements emerged as single rulers over the other chiefs and the surrounding population in the various districts. Thus, Crete became a land of small city kingdoms. The Minoans entered the Bronze Age, around 2700 to 2600 BC, and began communicating and trading with the Near East. They produced several highly valuable goods throughout the Mediterranean, such as wine, olive oil, wool, and lumber. The island today is fairly empty of trees, but in ancient times, they had giant forests of cypress, cedar, pine, and fir for the building of homes and ships. Cloth made from the wool of sheep brought a thriving textile industry to Crete. In addition, Several cities developed into major centers of metalwork, producing jewelry and tableware in bronze, gold, and silver for the local elites and also for export and trade. Thus, it is no surprise that by around 2000 BC, their society mainly was based on sea trade. Coastal locations of sites, combined with workshops and the richness of archaeological finds, reflects a society that was built mainly on import and export. This trade activity also has been dictated on many wall frescoes, showing large trading vessels bound for distant shores. While most boats were designed to hug the coasts, the Minoans had ships for the open ocean, which helped in making them the masters of Aegean and Eastern trade. Their location and natural harbors made them an important crossroad in the trade routes across the Mediterranean Sea. At the height of their influence, they had a trade network with mainland Greece, the Cyclades, Cyprus, Syria, Anatolia, Egypt, Mesopotamia, and as far westward as Spain. This extensive trade network can be illustrated by materials found on Crete, such as lapis lazuli, a deep blue semi-precious stone from Mesopotamia, and gold, ivory, and alabaster from Egypt and copper from Cyprus. The Egyptian record has referred to Crete as either Keftu or Kaftor. These two names are also found in the Old Testament and in the Hittite records. Some scholars believe that these names are not actually intended for Crete, but for Cyprus, the southern coast of Anatolia, or Rhodes. But paintings from Thebes in Egypt depict a number of individuals who are Minoan in appearance, bearing gifts. Inscriptions record these people as coming from Keftu, or the islands in the midst of the sea, and may refer to gift-bringing merchants or officials from Crete. And Minoan artwork has been found in the Canaanite palace of Tel Kabri in Israel. In addition, the Minoans founded colonies, including on various Cyclotic islands. The Cyclotic level of artistic achievement of the 3rd millennium BC was not maintained Marble figurines were sadly no longer made. For all intents and purposes, Middle Cyclotic is basically the same as Middle Minoan, as the islands increasingly fell under the cultural influence of Crete. Other colonies were established on Cathera, near the mainland, in Rhodes, near Anatolia. Obviously, these colonies helped spread Minoan culture throughout these two regions. 
The use of the term colony has been criticized by many scholars in recent years because that denotes a certain level of political control, which may or may not have been the case. There will be more on that later in this episode. Whatever you want to call it, we can use the politically correct phrase Centers for Cultural Exportation for now, but there was definitely a Minoanization going on. When Evans discovered Knossos, he created the chronology table mentioned in the last episode with early Minoan, middle Minoan, and late Minoan, which was subsequently also used on the Greek mainland and the Cyclades. He did this based on pottery in the presence of imported Egyptian artifacts, because early, middle, and late all roughly corresponded with the dates of the old, middle, and new kingdoms in Egyptian history. Another dating system, proposed by Greek archaeologist Nicholas Platten, is based on the development of the architectural complexes, known as palaces, and thus he divides Minoan chronology into pre-palatial, proto-palatial, neo-palatial, and post-palatial. The relationship between both systems can be seen on an accompanying chart on the website. I prefer to use Evans' system when talking about pottery, and the palatial system when describing the historical narratives. So that's what we will use. The period from around 2000 to 1700 BC is known as the Old Palace, or Proto-Palatial Period on Crete. The first royal palace in Crete was built at Knossos, which by then had several thousand inhabitants. Other major palaces, though not as big or as magnificent as Knossos, followed at Phaistos, which was located opposite of Knossos on the south side of the mountains, at Malia, which was 30 miles to the east of Knossos, and at Zagros, which was on the eastern coast of Crete, each controlling an area of a few hundred square miles. Nothing has been found in the western portion of Crete, though. The palace-centered economies that emerged in Crete, accordingly, were replicas, but on a much smaller scale, of the state economies of the Near East. Whether the small Minoan kingdoms were consolidated into a larger political unit, as was happening in the Near East at the time, remains an open question. One opinion is that by the 16th century BC, the island, or at least most of it, was a unified kingdom ruled by the king of Knossos. Others suggest that Knossos was the dominant center of a looser federation of self-ruling states, which to me seems more likely. The only source we have for the historical Minoans is a 5th century BC Athenian named Thucydides. In describing some background history and his treatment of the Peloponnesian War, he describes Minos' kingship as a thalassocracy, or a maritime empire, from the Greek words thalassa, or sea, and kraton, to rule. He then says, Minos, according to tradition, was the first person to organize a navy. He controlled the greater part of what is now called the Aegean Sea. He ruled over the Cyclades, and it is reasonable to assume that he did his best to put down piracy in order to secure his own revenues. Some scholars buy into Thucydides' claims. They argue that the existence of similar palaces around the Aegean is a sign that Crete was exercising direct political control over an empire of the sea, because one sign of an empire is that there's a consistence of cultural unity throughout. Others believed that the numerous islands of the Aegean were politically autonomous from Crete, and that Minoan influence was merely economic and cultural. The existence of similar palaces doesn't necessarily mean that Crete also exercised control over those similar palaces. These palaces could easily have been an imitation brought on by their close relation culturally and geographically to Minoan Crete. An interesting recent theory suggests that Thucydides' characterization of Minos as a naval leader was not meant to be historically accurate, but instead was an exaggeration made to bolster and reflect his fellow Athenians' concerns about piracy, trade, and similar issues in 5th century BC Athens. In any event, let's dive deeper into the Cretan myths to get a better understanding. As you will see, Minos' family has this weird bull fetish, starting with the kinky patriarch Zeus. According to the legend, Minos was a son of Zeus who took the form of a bull 
and carried off a young maiden named Europa on his back from Tyre in Phoenicia to Crete, hence the name Europe. He then transformed back into himself and made love to Europa, who eventually had Minos and two others from that union. The boys were adopted by the king of Crete, named Asterion, and when he died, Minos made a play for the throne and expelled his brothers, Radamanthus and Sarpedon, from the island. Minos then prayed for a sign, proving that the gods had given him his throne. So Poseidon, god of the sea, sent up a white bull from the waves as a divine answer. The bull was so beautiful. It was a gift from the gods after all. So Minos decided to switch out a regular bull instead. Why he thought this would work is beyond me. Anyway, when Minos failed to fulfill his promise to sacrifice the bull, Poseidon punished him by making his wife, Pasiphae, lust after the bull. The consequence of that union was the Minotaur, a half-man, half-bull creature. So Minos hires the architect Daedalus from Athens to construct a labyrinth underneath the palace at Knossos to contain the Minotaur. He also ironically helped Pasiphae make the wooden bull contraption so that the bull could make love to her. The labyrinth was a maze so complicated that all who entered wouldn't be able to find their way out. I suppose as a means to tie up loose ends. After he was finished, Minos imprisoned Daedalus and his son Icarus so that they wouldn't let out how to get out of the labyrinth. But Daedalus made two sets of artificial wings so that they could escape. He warned his son not to fly too close to the sun, for his wings would melt, or too close to the water, for his wings would grow too heavy. Icarus, though, flew too close to the sun, and he plunged into the ocean to his death. The middle course that he should have taken is the golden mean. Don't go to any extreme, but hold the middle course. All things should be done in moderation. At some point later, one of Minos' sons was killed while in Athens. Enraged, Minos waged war on the Athenians, resulting in Athens falling under his thumb. As punishment, the Athenian king Aegeus, every nine years, had to send seven young boys and seven maidens to be fed to the Minotaur. One year, the prince Theseus volunteered himself to be one of the sacrificial victims, wanting to end this once and for all. His father, King Aegeus, stipulated that if he returned alive, he was to change the black sail on the ship to white. When he arrived at Knossos, Minos' daughter, Ariadne, fell in love with him and thus gave him a ball of thread so that he could escape. He tied the thread to the door of the labyrinth, and it unwound after him as he went in, allowing him to find the entrance after he killed the Minotaur. He then escaped the island with Ariadne, but ditched her on Naxos, where she became the wife of Dionysius. When he returned home, he forgot to change the color on his banner from black to white. Thinking that his son was dead, Aegeus jumped off the cliffs at Cape Sun Union in the southern portion of Attica into the sea to his death, and the Aegean Sea took its name after him. As for Minos, he would pursue Daedalus to Sicily, to the court of King Cocalus. He met his end when Daedalus trapped him in a bath and scalded him with boiling water. Some have suggested that Minos was just the Cretan word for king. It may have been a particular king, and then subsequently was used as a title, like Caesar was used in the Roman Empire. Some scholars see a connection between Minos and the names of other ancient founder kings, such as Menes of Egypt and Manes of Phrygia and Lydia. Later authors, such as Diodorus Siculus and Plutarch, rationalized that there were two kings by the name of Minos. The first was the son of Zeus and was a good king, who was a benevolent ruler legislator and suppressor of piracy. He was held in such high esteem that he would become one of the three judges of the dead in the underworld. A second later Minos would be the one who ruled a wicked maritime empire. The debate over all mythical figures, like Minos, or whether they were actually real, purely mythical, or somewhere in the middle. More than likely, they were rooted in history, but in an elaborate mythology gradually evolved to the point that any distinct line between fact and fiction has been smudged beyond recognition. Regardless, the remains at Knossos indicate that they were definitely a powerful people, 
And the complexity of the site is what led Evans to believe that he had found the mythical labyrinth, although no archaeological evidence has been found to confirm the legend. Evans recreated part of Knossos, according to his vision of what he thought the city would have looked like, using wall paintings and artifacts as a guide. So we must keep in mind that it may not be all that accurate in actuality. His recreations have come under severe criticism over the years as being founded upon insufficient archaeological knowledge and for being irreversible. Regardless, visitors to the site have found the reconstructions to be great visual aids to the imagination and are dazzled by the site's size and complexity, as well as the elegance of its architecture. The palace covers over three acres, approximately 13,000 square meters, and form the center of the city that has only been partially excavated. There are four entrances to the complex, and it consisted of a maze of perhaps 300 rooms around a large central courtyard, measuring about 150 by 75 feet, where religious rituals and communal feasts probably took place. Most of the walls have their foundations in stone and rubble, but the main structure is built with large, unbaked mud bricks, interlaced with vertical and horizontal timbers and tie beams, holding together the two sides. The roof is flat, with a thick layer of clay over brushwood, resting on the wooden rafters. To the west of the courtyard stood the official quarters, including administrative offices, a throne room, workshops, and storerooms, with giant five feet tall storage jars, called pithoi. To the east of the courtyard was the domestic area. The remains of large interior and exterior staircases provide evidence of two and three story buildings with basements beneath, which Evans called lustral basins, and hypothesized that they were important for housing shrines for religious worship and used for purification. Porticos with columns and numerous balconies and staircases, all brightly painted, gave the exterior a theatrical look and add variety to the architecture. Windows had columns in the middle that could be opened up during nice weather, called a pier and door construction. These light wells brought daylight and fresh air into the interior of the palace. Walls and passageways were adorned with brightly colored paintings. Most have only survived as a series of fragments, relocated to the museums, and replicas have replaced them on site. Near its northern entrance is a stone theater capable of holding about 400 spectators. The orchestra area in these early theaters was not circular, as in later times, but rectangular shaped. Underneath it all, the Minoans developed the world's first indoor plumbing that shows just how sophisticated their culture was for their time. Clay pipes brought in clean water and a draining system took care of the waste. They had rudimentary flush toilets, hot and cold running water for baths, and heated floors, all things which the Western world wouldn't see again until the Romans. For a society this advanced, they enjoyed a standard of living that other civilizations did not. One of the most notable contributions of the Minoans to architecture is their unique column, which was wider at the top than the bottom. It is called an inverted column, because later Greek columns were wider at the bottom, in order to create an illusion of a greater height. The columns were also made of perishable wood, as opposed to stone, and were generally painted in red, black, and yellow. They were mounted on a simple stone base, and were topped with a round capital. Basically, they are stylized tree trunks. Evans has recreated several of these at Knossos. Other Minoan towns and their central palaces or large villages closely resembled Knossos. The palace at Phaistos was distinguished by an imposing entrance, with a flight of 12 steps, 45 feet wide. Although it is smaller than the palace at Knossos, its external appearance appears to have been more imposing, since it was built upon the top of a hill and dominated the wide plain of the Misara. About two miles off, at a place now called Hagia Triada, a palace-like building has been found, which seems to have served as a pleasure residence for the princes of Phaistos. A network of stone-paved roads linked the various palaces, the most important of which was the road through the mountains between Knossos and Phaistos. 
They were formed from blocks cut with bronze saws, a first in the Aegean. An impressive viaduct carried this road across the gully, just south of the palace at Knossos, and it has been said that the road to the north, linking Knossos with its port of Amnisos, is the oldest road in Europe. The redistributive economy developed around Knossos and the other palaces, where the palaces had considerable control over the allocation and the use of the surrounding land, much of which belonged directly to the palace. Produce from the palace's lands, along with produce from private farms paid as taxes, was funneled into the palace. The king could distribute these as he willed. In other words, the palaces did not support a market economy in which agricultural products and manufactured goods are exchanged through buying and selling. People out in the countryside may not have participated in the redistribution system, living off of their own means and perhaps occasionally selling goods to other independent farmers. Regardless, the influx of food and raw materials provided the royal family with a luxurious lifestyle and also supplied the needs of the workers in the palace complex. In addition, the great quantities of produce stored in the palace formed a reserve for distribution to the populace in times of famine. However, the large areas of the palace, devoted to storage and workshops, indicate that a significant portion of what was produced and stored was meant to process raw materials from the countryside into material goods to be traded. Food, animals, and goods would have been passed between the palaces and into the smaller villages, but it was their exchange of materials and goods on the Mediterranean-wide market, however, that made Knossos and the other Minoan palaces so rich. The rise of the palace culture and their new type of urbanized, centralized society with redistribution centers required more storage vessels and ones more specifically suited to a range of functions. In palace workshops, standardization suggests more supervised operations and the rise of elite wares, emphasizing refinements and novelty so that palace and provincial pottery became differentiated. The palatial pottery of this period is known as Kamari's ware because it was first found in the Kamari's cave. Kamari's is strongly associated with Nassos and Phaestos and has two types. The first is extremely thin and delicate and was used for tableware. These vessels required a great deal of expertise by the potter in the forming and firing of them. The introduction from the Levant of the potter's wheel enabled perfectly symmetrical bodies to be thrown from swiftly revolving clay that quickened the speed of production and extend to the range of shapes. The second type is heavier and coarser and was used for storage and pouring vessels. Both types are characterized by emphatic white on black decoration and the use of accent colors of yellow, red, and orange. The designs painted all around the vessel are bold, semi-abstract, with linear patterns of spirals, triangles, and curved lines, but recognizably related to nature. There is no conflict between decoration and shape. Around 1900 BC, in order to manage more efficiently the diversity and complexity of their palace economy, the Minoans adopted a pictographic form of writing known as Cretan hieroglyphs, in which a picture symbolizes a natural object or idea. It's possible that Cretan hieroglyphs developed independently, but knowledge of Egyptian hieroglyphs and other Semitic scripts from Southwest Asia Minor probably contributed. It has been found on clay tablets, on vases, and on stone seals. A famous example of this script is found on the Phaestos disc. It has 45 different figural and abstract panels for a total of 241 symbols on the one disc, which were made by pressing seals into a disc of soft clay in a clockwise sequence spiraling toward the center of the disc. Its purpose and meaning is unknown and is one of the most famous mysteries of archaeology. These hieroglyphs must have been too cumbersome to use because a more simplified form of writing emerged a century later around 1800 BC. This more stylized linear script, made up of specific signs that stood for syllables and were joined together to form the sound of the words themselves, was called Linear A by Evans, to distinguish from Linear B, which will come later. Linear A has been preserved on small clay tablets and both continued to be in use in parallel for a century or so. Although Cretan hieroglyphics have only been found on Crete, 
while the use of Linear A was exported to some of the Aegean islands, such as Kia, Kythera, Milos, and Thera, and the Greek mainland in Laconia. Although both Cretan hieroglyphs and Linear A are still undeciphered, it is clear that neither is related to Greek at all. Linear A is understood to have been used for records in the form of lists, such as goods received, goods paid out, inventories of stored goods, livestock, land holdings, and so forth. There is no Minoan literature or poetry known to us, or anything that provides names of individuals, a king's list, or chronicles of anything that was happening, like we are used to getting in the Near East at this time. Evidence of a class society shows up archaeologically, as the architecture and finds at Knossos and other palaces give us a good idea of the enormous luxury enjoyed by the royal family. Archaeologists have also found two- and three-story houses, indicating the existence of well-off nobility, who were probably part of the administrative and commercial sectors. Their houses contain many of the features of the palace, such as frescoes and storerooms. On the other hand, the thousands of ordinary farmers and crafts workers lived in small houses, built one right next to the other. The so-called town mosaic, a series of some two dozen mold plaques, representing building facades, which probably decorated some surface or wooden chest, gives an idea of the appearance of Minoan houses. They are tall and rectangular, with what looks like an attic on the top. Windows are more frequent in the upper parts, and oiled parchment may have been used as a substitute for glass. In Crete, as in all ancient kingdoms, the king was the embodiment of the state, the supreme ruler, lawgiver, and judge and the representative of the people to the gods. Cultural historians believe this enlargement of a ruler's religious function was one of the key factors in the rise of monarchical power. Homer speaks of a Minos, who was on familiar terms with great Zeus. This, taken with other evidence, has led some scholars to believe that Minoan kings ruled as priest kings, like those in the Near East, who administered the religious affairs of the kingdom. Evans, for example, believed the wall painting known as the Prince of the Lilies to be an image of a priest king, with his reaching out to lead an unseen animal to sacrifice. A major difference, though, is that Bronze Age Crete lacked the huge temple complexes of the Near East. Rather, the palaces themselves appear to have been the religious centers of society. Many Minoan religious objects have been found, but our exact knowledge of Minoan religion is incomplete. It was centered on the forces of nature, and nature demons in the form of animals reoccur on paintings. The Minoans were polytheistic, and worshipped mainly female deities, with the most popular seeming to have been a mother goddess of fertility, and a mistress of the animals, who is sometimes guarded by lions and associated with doves. Similarly, a one-foot statuette, known as the snake goddess, shows her holding snakes in each hand with a feline creature on her head. It may be a representation of the goddess who protects the palace, another fertility goddess figurine, or a priestess. She could be implying human power over the animal kingdom, but without knowledge of their religious practices, we may never know its true meaning or function. The snake goddess was constructed with the faience technique, an opaque glass-like silicate popular amongst the Egyptians. The few representations of male gods suggest that they had a secondary role, although in later times, the Greeks gave a Cretan origin to Zeus, as he was reared in a cave as a child. There is no evidence of public temples during this time. The sacred places were in caves and on the peaks of certain mountains. Here, the people brought offerings to some form of public cult by evidence of terracotta vessels from which libations would have been poured. Also, images from the Hagia Triada sarcophagus show that animal sacrifices took place. Human and animal clay figurines have also been found. There were also rustic shrines to some form of a tree cult with ritual dances to stimulate the epiphany of the divine. In some private homes, there were domestic sanctuaries, but the palace seems to have been the focal point of the people's religion. The belief is that religious ceremonies took place in the courtyard, these spectacles would draw everyone in from the countryside, the priestesses officiated them, and then food or other commodities were redistributed to the people. 
Their two sacred symbols were bulls and the labrys, which is a double-headed axe. Symbols in the shape of bull's horns appear frequently at Knossos. One of my favorite pieces of Minoan artwork is the bull's head riton, believed to be a ritual vessel for pouring liquid. Like most ritons, it has two openings, a larger one on the back of the neck and a smaller one at the mouth. Liquid was scooped up from the larger opening and flowed out through the smaller one. This is a masterpiece of sculpture. Its use of contrasting materials in the eyes make it appear lifelike. The labrys is associated with the sacrifice of the bulls and is the root word for the term labyrinth. Miniature labrys were found probably as votive offerings. The symbol also is often found on pottery and on a wall on the palace at Knossos, which is thus known as the House of the Double Axe. There is very little evidence of a darker side of religion, and it is significant that the Minoans seem to attach little importance to their burials, suggesting that they did not feel a need to store possessions to accompany them in the afterlife. Minoan artwork had no contemporary equal. The greatest collection of Minoan art is in the Archaeological Museum in Heraklion, the modern-day city near Knossos, although some is at Athens. Most of the designs of the Middle Minoan period are taken from marine life, or nature, with fish, octopi, dolphins, birds, and lilies being particularly favored subjects. Even the most sophisticated pieces give the impression of spontaneity. Minoan metalwork also was highly sophisticated, as they created elaborate pieces with imported gold and copper. They used a technique called repousse, in which a sheet of gold was hammered from the underside in order to push out the images, and then tools were used to refine and finish the shapes on the front. They were masters at welding gold pieces together into intricate pieces of jewelry. Popular pieces were bead necklaces, bracelets, and hair ornaments. The Minoan artists also put forth the same detailed sensitivity in their frescoes, which is the art of applying colors and designs to a wet plaster. They were Egyptian-influenced, but unlike their Near Eastern counterparts, whose predominant function of palace art was to glorify the royal household by depicting kings as mighty conquerors and powerful rulers. These frescoes show a civilization that rejoiced in the natural world and was not preoccupied with the afterlife. Although Egyptian scene paintings were more accurate in detail, Minoan painters were better at conveying a sense of movement and life, such as their images of bull leaping, which is one of the famous frescoes found at Knossos. Acrobatic sports became popular as a spectacle in which youths would catch hold of the horns of a charging bull and somersault along its back. Such acts were likely part of a religious celebration. Bulls were sacred and powerful in antiquity and represented mankind's mastery of nature. The Egyptians, Hittites, and Canaanites all had a reverence for bulls. Other Minoan paintings reflected their love for agriculture with images of flora and fauna. Images of papyri and crocodiles were obviously influenced by the Egyptians as well. Nature motifs were everywhere in Minoan palaces, making it seem like a place of serenity and happiness. Minoan frescoes have preserved a visual image of what the people looked like. They portray both genders mingling at public events in such a way that one might think Minoan society was matriarchal, or at the very least, the status of women appears to have been very high. In appearance, the ladies of the court were very sophisticated, as seen in the ladies in blue fresco. Both the genders are depicted as young, slender, and graceful, with long wavy hair and adorned in gold bracelets and necklaces. In particular, men are often portrayed nude or wearing only a loincloth or short kilt, similar to the Egyptian male dress, while the women have elaborate hairstyles and wear decorative floor-length skirts. Some show women wearing tight-sleeved bodices that expose their breasts. The patterns on clothes emphasize symmetrical geometric designs. Given the fragility of organic materials, other forms of dress may have been worn of which no archaeological evidence exists. Regardless, their portraits show them drawn in profile with a frontal eye, the males having reddish-brown skin and the females having white, because their lives were indoors and out of the sun. In these aspects, we can see Egyptian influences, but in all others, they are different and original, so the Minoans only borrowed what they liked and disregarded the rest. 
The Minoan civilization was able to progress without any disturbances because they were isolated on a large island and held many trade ties. Thus, they did not have the constant threat of evasions that those in the Near East had to worry about. For example, the constant warmongering of other contemporaries of the ancient Minoans, the Egyptians and Hittites, is well documented. Also, while several sites were built on hilltops, they did not have any defenses by means of fortified walls, implying that Minoan settlements saw no need to fortify themselves against each other, or from foreign threats. Furthermore, Minoan artwork is devoid of combat scenes, and those weapons that are portrayed are only shown in a ceremonial context. There aren't any physical remains of Minoan shipwrecks to know if their ships were military in nature either, but those who believe in the existence of a Minoan thalassocracy claim that any civilization with a cultural network as wide as Minoan Crete would eventually have to deal with the security of that network. Pirates have always been attracted to material wealth, something Crete possessed in large measure. Thus, it's highly likely that they had to deal with piracy on at least some level, and this image of the Minoans being an anti-war, peace-loving, mercantile-only people may be overstated. The first signs of trouble occurred around 1700 BC, when a great earthquake devastated and destroyed the palaces at Knossos, Phaistos, Malia, and Zakros. This disaster rattled the Minoans, but they bounced back even stronger, embarking on the New Palace, or Neo-Palatial period, from around 1700 to 1600 BC, which is considered the golden age in Minoan art and architecture, and influence in the Eastern Mediterranean. Minoan population also increased, with many new settlements having developed on Crete. This period also saw the growth in expertise in bronze sword making. Bronze daggers could be made longer and would bend in combat rather than break, which then led to early sword designs that were two to three feet long. Shortly thereafter, they began appearing in the Black and Aegean Sea regions, and the Minoans' craftsmen became known as the finest sword makers of the time. A volcanic eruption on the island of Thera modern-day Santorini, the southernmost island of the Cyclades, occurred sometime between 1650 and 1625 BC and was one of the largest blasts in history. Thera used to be a round island, but this eruption spewed forth such a massive amount of magma that it caused some of the land to collapse and sink beneath the water, creating the modern-day crescent-shaped island. The body of water created between the mainland and the volcano, is called the caldera. The eruption also left thermal springs, although they are lukewarm due to the coldness of the Mediterranean. A mixture of gas, magma, and volcanic rock traveled fast in waves and burnt everything within at least a 12-mile radius. The large port city of Akrotiri, on the southern tip of the island, however, was enclosed in 150 feet of pumice, that has allowed it to be preserved to this day. Apparently, unlike at Pompeii, tremors were felt in advance of the actual event that allowed them to evacuate, so the ruins didn't include any human remains. Scholars hypothesize this forewarning because they found broken steps, collapsed walls, and heaps of debris that signified an earthquake occurred. This eruption did leave its imprint on the mythology of the Egyptians and Greeks. Those who happened to be close enough to see the eruption obviously died, and those who didn't see anything came up with theories to explain the overnight disappearance of a people without knowledge of what happened. In Hesiod's Theogony, written in the 7th century BC, he talked about the creation of the world and the generation of gods. In describing the Titanomachy, the war between the Olympian gods and the Titans, Hesiod remarks that Zeus's thunderbolts were like volcanic lightning with immense flame and heat. These lines have sometimes been attributed to describing the folklore surrounding this eruption. The gods, who controlled the forces of nature, were fighting and in doing so the climate changed and catastrophic events took place. In Plato's Timaeus, written in the 4th century BC, he talks about a legend, which was preserved in Egypt. Their priests kept records, and one in particular talked about destruction through floods and earthquakes, and the disappearance of an island. Thus, it has been suggested that Thera might be the origin for the Atlantis legend. However, there are no surviving Egyptian records of the eruption, and the absence of such records is sometimes attributed to the general disorder in Egypt during what is called the Second Intermediate Period, 
a time in between Egypt's Middle and New Kingdoms, when outside invaders, known as the Hyksos, had control over the Nile Delta. Even Egyptian records for this time period are scarce compared to other times. However, a stele by Amose, who had reinstituted Egyptian native control, describes heavy rainstorms that devastated much of Egypt. Some have attributed these short-term climate changes as consequential effects by the Theron eruption. As stated before, the idea that the Minoans exercised actual political control outside of Crete is doubtful. They did, however, exert considerable economic and cultural influence in the Cyclotic Islands, and a remarkable example of Minoan cultural hegemony can be seen at Akrotiri. Excavations began in 1967 by Greek archaeologist Spiridon Marinatos and are still ongoing. Judging by the size of Akrotiri, the port city probably had around 30,000 inhabitants. The hardened ash formed a protective envelope, allowing us to see a detailed picture of town life at the height of Minoan civilization. No palace or similarly imposing building has been found yet. Nonetheless, there is clear evidence of Minoan influence with paved streets, an extensive drainage system, the production of high-quality pottery, and further craft specialization, which all point to the level of sophistication achieved by the settlement. The frescoes that adorn the walls of a number of houses are very similar and also equal in imagination and execution to the finest paintings from Crete, the most famous of which are the boxing twins, the fishermen, the ladies, the lilies, the monkeys, the papyri, and the ship procession and are considered among the best Bronze Age frescoes produced. Less spectacular finds from other Cyclotic islands show a similar Minoanization in such things as art, religion, dress, and lifestyles. Nevertheless, several distinctly local features among the island cultures indicate that those prosperous islands were independent societies, trading partners, not colonial outposts of a Minoan empire. Nowadays, most scholars believe that the eruption of Thera was a catalyst for the decline of the Minoan civilization based on Crete, which sits about 90 miles south of Thera. Earlier theories proposed that ash fell on the eastern half of Crete and killed off all plant life and starved the population. However, that has been disproved, and the modern belief is that the volcanic eruption caused huge tidal waves with estimates of at least 65 feet high which destroyed the shipping towns and ports on the northern shore and most of Crete's merchant ships, striking at the heart of Minoan culture and livelihood. Also, it would have left a huge mass of pumice floating on the surface of the Aegean Sea for several weeks afterwards. Furthermore, the ash and the smoke in the air would have blocked out the sunlight for a long time, which would have caused all sorts of weather disturbances and disrupted the growing season. In fact, evidence shows a decline in material wealth and quality after the eruption, as well as a decline in the importance of Knossos as a power center, which corroborates this theory. The Minoans weren't able to bounce back this time, though, because the Mycenaean Greeks on the mainland overtook them as the economic power in the Aegean Sea. The Mycenaeans were pirates, who attacked undefended coastal villages in the Aegean and Anatolia. There was nobody to stop them. Of the two great empires of the late Bronze Age, the Hittites and the Egyptians, neither had a naval fleet. Thus they had free reign to go after whomever they wanted, and the biggest prize of all was a weakened island of Crete, their only competition in trade. Evidence shows that around 1450 to 1425 BC, they reached Crete, and the palaces of Phaistos, Malia, and Zakros were destroyed by fire, as well as numerous country villas and small towns. A concentrated study of the pottery shows that the palace at Knossos was spared and came under control of the Mycenaeans. This theory is backed by archaeological evidence dated to the late Minoan period, with a new emphasis on weapons and burials, the adoption of the Mycenaean chamber tomb, and what seems to be a mainland influence on their pottery. Also, evidence suggests that Minoan exports around the Aegean started to decline, while Mycenaean exports rose, and on several Cyclotic islands, Mycenaean cultural influences appear more prominently, but the decisive evidence was writing. Contact with the civilization of Minoan Crete was tremendously influential for Mycenaean civilization. As the art and goods of the Mycenaeans in the mid-2nd millennium BC 
display many features clearly reminiscent of Minoan design. Thus, Evans argued that the Minoans had inspired Mycenaean civilization by sending colonists to the mainland. Evans found over 3,000 clay tablets at Knossos, baked by the fire which accompanied its later destruction, with a more elaborate version of the linear script, and he considered it to be a later development of Linear A, which he called Linear B. About 20 Linear A signs ceased to be used, and their place was taken by 10 new ones. There are 88 signs in all in Linear B, which is too many for an alphabet and too few for a fully pictographic script. Regardless, Evans assumed without question that the language of both was Cretan. The discovery in 1939 by Carl Blagon of a massive hall of 600 Linear B tablets in the ruins of Pylos on the southwestern Greek mainland meant that there was now a sufficient amount of material to allow serious attempts at decipherment of the Linear B tablets. Even so, the tablets presented an enormous challenge because the script was totally unlike any of the other writing systems in use among the late Bronze Age civilizations, and nobody knew what the underlying language was. Relatively little progress was made until the 1950s when a British cryptologist named Michael Ventris cracked the code. Working from the assumption that the symbols stood for whole syllables rather than single letters, and that Linear B might possibly be an earlier form of Greek and not Minoan after all, he was able to see similarities in some words and accurately guessed that they might be city names. Once he cracked a few syllables, he worked feverishly to translate the rest. In 1953, Ventris published his findings in a famous article that has completely changed our picture of the Bronze Age Aegean. We now know with confidence that the Mycenaeans were Greek speakers. They adapted Linear A to their own Greek language, and they were ruling in Crete by the 15th century BC. More recent finds of Linear B tablets at Pylos, Mycenae, Tyrants, and Thebes on the Greek mainland, as well as at Hania on Crete, have increased the amount of tablets to about 5,000 total. The letdown, though, was that Linear B was used for the same purpose as Linear A, which was mostly bookkeeping, records, and transactions, and there's nothing juicy that would prove the existence of any of the Bronze Age heroes of myth. Thus, the new standard belief is that the Mycenaeans adapted the palaces for their own use and used it as an administrative base, overseeing their new colony on Crete, where they came to appreciate and transmit many aspects of Minoan culture back to the mainland, including the development of the new Linear B script, the building of large palaces, and the development of palace-based economics. Cretan society and culture under the rule of the already Minoanized Mycenaean invaders did not change much. However, for the most part, life went on as before, and the new kings ruled and lived in the manner of Minoan kings. From the 15th century BC onward, we can speak of a Minoan Mycenaean culture, a dynamic fusion of the two, which was further enriched by continuing influences from the Near East and Egypt. However, something soured in this relationship, as evidence shows that Knossos shared the same fate and was sacked and burned around 1375 to 1350 BC. One can still see the marks made on stones by blazing wood and black smoke. Possibly, it was other Mycenaeans from the mainland that saw the palace at Knossos as a rival and moved to eliminate it. Although the island continued to be occupied, Mycenae and Crete sank in importance while the other mainland centers reached the zenith of their prosperity and influence in the Aegean. Regardless, the Mycenaean conquest marks the official end of Minoan civilization as the Cretans fell under their dominion. This is reflected also in the ancient sources. In Homer's Iliad, Agamemnon calls upon Crete to join him in his war against Troy, since they are one of his dependencies, and Homer said that the Cretans were the best archers in his army. In antiquity, archers were looked down upon, since real men fought in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He also calls the Cretans very exotic, with strange customs. How much of the ancient sources are true? That there were great kings of Knossos with a strong fleet is beyond a doubt yet we know nothing further about an individual Minos. Stories of Daedalus, a craftsman and architect of fantastic skill, may have stemmed from admiration of the advanced skills shown in all kinds of workmanship in the palace. 
This palace, large and complicated in layout, with many stairways, long corridors, and countless rooms, may itself have been the labyrinth. Labrys was the word used for an axe and carry in Asia Minor, and labyrinth probably meant the place of the double axe, acquiring the meaning of a maze from the complex plan of the palace. The origins of the Minotaur story, the name simply means Bull of Minos, are possibly to be detected in the religious importance of bulls. These examples show that Evans had some justification for writing. The work of the spade has now brought out the underlying truth of the old traditions that made Gnosis, the home of Minos and Daedalus, the most ancient center of civilized life in Greece and with it of our whole continent. In the next episode, we will return to the Greek mainland and take a look at what the Mycenaean Greeks were up to, before and after the decline of Minoan civilization. So tune in next time to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 6, Mycenaean Greece. If you haven't done so yet, please head on over to iTunes and rate and review the show. It would help the podcast grow immensely. Also, while you're there, Subscribe to the show so it comes on your phone every week. If you don't have iTunes, you can catch the show on SoundCloud, Stitcher, or Google Play. Also, make sure you are checking out the website at thehistoryofancientgreece.com, where I've posted a lot of neat supplementary photos, maps, and charts for each episode. Thanks, everyone, for your continued support, and I hope you're enjoying the podcast. I would like to give a special thanks to the amazing artist Michael Levy for allowing me to feature his music on this podcast. He transports you to the ancient world, bringing to life the melodies and using the techniques of the past. A new song will be played every episode. This one is titled, Hymn to Artemis, from his album, The Ancient Greek Cathar of Classical Antiquity. If you like what you heard and are curious to learn more about ancient Greek music, check out his website at ancientlyre.com. His albums are available in every major digital music store, including iTunes, Amazon, and Spotify.